Hello, hello. I'm Celeste, and this is Week by Week. On today's episode, I start out with a conversation with my husband. Surprise, surprise. For new listeners, I start out almost every episode with a conversation with my husband. So there you have it. And later on, we have the wonderful Laura Hallway. Let's do this. In my conversation with our guest this week, one thing that she kind of got me thinking about was the lessons you can learn about yourself from watching your kids and how that can inform your own growth. So I wanted to open that up to you and see if that hit you in any way or if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah. One thing that I really wanted to instill in him was a commitment to trying and not making it about doing the perfect thing each time or that life isn't a series of pass-fail experiences. Mm -hmm. You know, from something as simple as trying to open a drawer or learn a new skill Mm -hmm. to how he's reacting to other people or Mm -hmm. anything, Mm -hmm. I've just tried to make it about trying and not about a result. And then watching him do that and take that and so far really do it is really informed me back. How so? Because it's something that I really struggle with. Mm. And watching him discover and the joy that he takes in trying stuff and Mm. just playing, it's reignited that spark in me too. How do you see it showing up in yourself? I think that I'm lowering the stakes of any one interaction a lot more. Oh, that's great. Lowering the stakes of any one, like a meeting that I have Mm -hmm. or a conversation that I have or for work, like a pitch or some sort of business conversation Mm -hmm. or negotiation. Previously, I would have treated like every single instance of that as like kind of like a pass fail life or death kind of instance. Yeah, yeah. And I really feel myself lowering those stakes. I really feel myself understanding that life and work and, you know, all the different parts of being a person really are a process. Yeah, yeah. And it's very rare that any points of that process are truly pass fail. They yeah. happen, yeah. but they're certainly not every day. Yeah. You know, so. Or that all of the history from behind you and all of the future potential going forward, I feel like sometimes it's so easy to be like, well, everything is resting on this one yes. thing and taking away all the context of like you are not existing in like a bubble. Yep. Which is funny because one of the things I was going to say is almost the opposite of that, but supports <laughs> it. And that is like for me, when I think about it, one of the biggest things for me is I think it's gotten me to focus on not just in a aspirational way, focusing on trying to be present, but really bringing me into the present moment. Mm-hmm. And I think up until this point, the only place that I felt like full presence in a way that I could deliberately return to was when I was performing Mm -hmm. and when I was like inside of art and then it felt free to kind of just be in that moment and I think that's one of the things I love so much about performing Mm -hmm. but I think that in parenthood what I've learned is there are all these little little tiny moments that are so delightful to be a part of yeah or if you are resisting those moments in the moments when you are frustrated or whatever, it doesn't work. You have to be present. Yep. It ha- it just, it pulls you back in. It's like, so I think that it's become more of a deliberate practice on my day to day. And it's felt really exciting. And I think that yeah. like watching him too and seeing how in the moment and present he is, yeah. I've learned so much about slowing down. Yeah. I think that's the other thing. It's really, 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 really taught me about slowing down. And I am somebody who tends to think fast and talk fast and feel fast. And I just tend to operate out of that kind of speed. And a lot of times, if I'm being honest, that doesn't necessarily serve me. I get ahead of myself or I miss something or I'm (laughs) clumsy. And so, you know, I'm trying to do five things at once and I end up banging into something or letting 
either the metaphoric or the actual ball drop, you know? And so I think that... You really need to stop juggling around the house. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) But I think having the opportunity to really practice day in and day out, slowing down has really been fulfilling for me and and informative for me. Another like sliver or maybe wrinkle of Mm -hmm. that is, and you were kind of saying it, but just to maybe say it slightly different language or or a different aspect of it, Mm -hmm. you don't have time, nor should you take the time to get stuck on one emotional place. Yeah. Because... You want to be there for him. Mm -hmm. And in addition, you realize that because he's so moment to moment and when you're with him, you can be so moment to Mm -hmm. moment. Why get hung up on it? You're just taking away from, you know. I'd phrase that slightly differently, but I think I align with what you're saying. Yeah. And what I would say is it's not that you can't get stuck on an emotional moment. It's that you're watching your child model in a healthy way moving through I'm having a tantrum now I'm having the time of my life now I'm laughing now I'm and so because of that you look at yourself and I think you go oh I can cycle through my emotions because I think as you get older you get resistant of like better not feel frustrated better not feel angry better not feel sad like we we kind of rope off certain emotions as bad or off limits or inconvenient. And I think that there is such a power in being able to acknowledge and let yourself just move through it. Because I think the stuckness comes in the resistance of the emotion. And this is not saying that you can necessarily always have the emotional experience the second you want to have it. But I think there's less resistance to going to the places that can feel like frustration that, and you go, well, I shouldn't feel frustrated about this or I yeah. shouldn't be mad about this or whatever. And you go like, oh, okay, I watched him move through it. And wow, we're on to the next thing because of it. So like, can I take that skill and, and interpret it into my own adult life? Yeah. Yes to all that. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yes. I realized what I was really trying to say is that what I meant by stuck is stuck on an emotion that I had that I brought into a moment with him. Mm. something from before Mm -hmm. that was just like Mm, you know sticking with me or you know kind of like clinging to me Mm -hmm. if you hadn't moved through it and you had a residual emotion and then you have to move and you're interacting with your son right you go like well i can't sit in this thinking about the past now i have to bring myself back to the present And then, no, I guess if you have this residual thing, like, I am going to have to deal with it at some point. I may have to or may not. Or it or may, I'll let it or go. It may, or it may just on its own organically right. dissipate right. because you're onto something else, right. you know? I mean, I think that I don't want to put this on him, nor do I expect this of him as he gets older, but there is not a lot of better medicine for being cranky or feeling bad than walking in a room and have that little guy look yeah. up at you and smile. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's you know, I don't I don't require it of him no. or expect it of him, but he sure is nice. It sure is nice when he does it. But I and think... sometimes you walk into a room and he's like, ah, yeah. you know, and that's fine too. But I think the core idea of that, if you were to distill it down, is like remembering with anybody or even with yourself, connection. Mm-hmm. That's connection. So mm-hmm. it's like, can I come to present moment and connect with the person I'm walking into the room with? Could be you, could be a friend, could be whatever. Can I take this moment to walk out of the room and connect with myself and get quiet with myself and feel grounded? All of these are just different attempts, I think, to ground so you can show up for the people in your life, but also for moment. yourself. Yeah, in the moment. In the moment. Yeah. yeah. Tell me one thing that you're thinking right now in the moment <laughs> i'm hungry <laughs> okay it's almost dinner time it's been a long day i'm hungry it's been a long day so on that note we're gonna sign off <laughs> <laughs> our guest today is laura hallway laura is an artist coach and teacher who works with heart-centered humans on growing radical businesses and more intentional lives Her coaching work began a decade ago after a bad case of artistic burnout and a desire to help other creative people find more support and sustainability. Laura writes a bi-monthly letter called The Makings and hosts the podcast Grow From Center. She's a mom, karaoke enthusiast, clinical counseling grad student, and a mediocre gardener. 
You can learn more about Laura and her work at laurahallway.com. And we'll also link that info in the show notes. Laura is so wonderful. You can feel her openness and her compassion. And I got so much out of this conversation. So let's do this. I wanted to start off with just hearing a little bit about the work that you do. Yeah, so I am a coach and consultant and teacher, and I am playing with this question of how do we live a a nourishing, satisfying, heart-centered life within the parameters of capitalism that we're, we're working with, and what possibilities emerge when we lead with our values and our purpose and even our needs. And so what that looks like, it started off looking a lot like supporting creative people and finding more financial sustainability and energetic sustainability and consulting with different creative organizations. And now it's broadened a little bit to working with anyone who kind of wants to shift their life in a direction that feels more values centered. And sometimes that a big part of that is just figuring out what that even means, Mm. especially given any life transition, we're always going through life transitions like parenthood. Mm -hmm. And it tends to just really shake things up and cause us to have to, you know, return to the drawing board and say, okay, so this worked for me before, but now I need something else. And what is that? And it strikes me that that takes a lot of bravery, too, to say, like, okay, I'm going to take the first step toward finding a more nourishing life or reevaluating the things that maybe aren't working for me anymore, especially in the context of a huge transition. If somebody wants to approach this work, do you have, like, a first step that they can take or something that you you kind of offer to people as they're beginning? Well, first of all, it is, I think, a really – brave thing to admit that something's not working or needs some adjusting. And sometimes I feel like that's the the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's just carving out the time and the space for that. So that is the first step that I would recommend is, can you just carve out a tiny enough space that you can just sit with yourself a little bit and kind of get a lay of the land Mm -hmm. and notice those things that are probably so ingrained in your life that you're not even fully conscious of them. You know, I think of how many times I have feelings and thoughts that I'm not fully conscious of, or maybe something has been a pattern that has just not been serving me for a long time. It really takes that pause and that moment of sitting with yourself and noticing and starting to get curious and not beating yourself up that it's not working. Yeah. You know, letting it be an opportunity to open the door and and recognize that, you know, this is it's very it's very normal <laughs> to have to need to reevaluate and shift and yeah, to let your curiosity lead. What I like about how you describe that is it also really strikes me of like, how do you make space for yourself and inside of yourself and hold that for your own self? And I think that that takes deliberate practice and awareness and just to be able to know like, oh, I need to pause or breathe for a second is such a gift you can give to yourself. I love that you used practice, which is just one of my favorite words because it is a practice. And the whole idea with practice, as you know, as an actor, is that we don't expect it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. We're there to like, you know, develop a new muscle. And I think that's a lot of where coaching comes in is just that it is so hard to hold space for ourselves that we crave containers. And sometimes the container looks like a recurring friend date. And sometimes the container looks like a class that you take. And sometimes it looks like hiring a coach. But the hardest person to hold space for is ourselves. Mm-hmm. We do it with such ease for our children and for our you know partner and our loved ones. But then doing it for ourselves, it's uncomfortable. It absolutely is. So when you are identifying those values, do you find the people you're working with kind of know those? Or is that something you dig in deep with people to kind of evaluate? Because I think what comes to mind for me when I'm thinking about it is like, 
I know my like baseline inherent values where I go like this is a make or break issue for me. But then moving into something like parenthood, your brain expands and your heart expands and your what you're aware of every day expands. And it starts to feel like there is this need to reevaluate some things and fi- figure out like, what do I value? What do I care about? Where are my passions? How do you go about identifying those things with people? A lot of it is just doing some detective work together. And I like when you were talking about how your heart and your brain expands with parenthood. I like to think about our values as something that are, you know, it's very tailored to the phase of life we are in. Like they change. And when we outgrow them or, you know, they change again, it's more of what are the priorities for what I want to say yes to than I don't care about these things. Because Mm. probably we have so many values, (laughs) you know, like I love social justice work. And I don't volunteer regularly because it's incorporated into my life in a different way, for instance. So yeah, it's some detective work. Part of it is learning how to get a felt sense in our bodies for like what lights us up just on a like, what makes me zing? What are moments in my life that have given me that feeling? And then on the flip side of that, What is leaving me feeling like very depleted every single time? And I don't want to continue to to center my life around that. Mm. So noticing those things, kind of looking back, doing some dreaming is sometimes a really lovely exercise that, again, is is a practice, especially given that we've just come out of a pandemic where maybe a lot of us experienced a lot of dreams getting dashed. (laughs) And it doesn't necessarily feel like the safest activity, but what do I envision my days looking like? Like, if we're so quick to notice what we don't like, but what, what do, what is, what works really well? Like, what, what would life incorporating parenthood in the way that I know is important to me look like? Because there are more possibilities than I think we realize We've often seen like very traditional models of business and parenthood and life, but there's also an array of other ways of doing things, you know, like thinking of your parents less. Mm -hmm. It's like not the most traditional upbringing. Yeah. And the same goes for the upbringing that I had. And so it's nice to remember there are so many ways of doing things and we have to find the rules that work best for us. And then we have to reinvent when our circumstances change. When your circumstances do change from the pandemic, from life happening, what are ways that you've found to help guide people through the things that come up that you wouldn't have said yes to or were not in your plan or your dreams? That's so hard. I mean, it's really hard. I mean, there is a certain amount of grief work to be done, I guess I would say, for lack of a better way. I mean... You know, I think part of what's what has set me up well to do this work is that I have experienced so much change in my life. You know, I went through a really unforeseen divorce. I now have a very positive co-parenting relationship with my former spouse. But this, in many ways, also was not the life that I envisioned for myself. It wasn't how I foresaw raising my son. Mm-hmm. And there is... Grief in that, like acceptance is, as I often think, like it's a very long word. (laughs) I'm like, it is a lot to swallow. Mm -hmm. And there's great freedom when you move towards it. But part of it is like giving yourself the permission to stomp your feet. Yes. Have a tantrum. Yes. And that's what is so beautiful about how children process things. And my son has actually been like such a, a gift to me during this time because he hates change. Mm. And he has reminded me that we are conditioned as adults to accept change because we have no other option and it's the right thing to do. And, but one day, one day I switched vitamin brands and he was like epically pissed off. And he was like, (laughs) but I was used to the other one. And I was like, thank you. I was used to that too. And I don't like this. And you are really validating the feelings that I've been having 
for the last couple of years of like, no, this isn't what I wanted. I didn't want a pandemic. I didn't want to be by myself. The list goes on. And the more I give myself permission to feel that way and to lean into that, the more I'm able to move forward. Yes, that it, it, just the expression of it, then it frees something up. So it's not like you're holding it and just trying to muscle your way through the next step. I think that's huge. Yes. I think kids can be such a incredible reminder of all of these things that as adults, we feel like we should just be able to do or like, well, acceptance is important. So I should be able to accept or like, I get so mad at myself for not knowing how to do something. And then I watch my son like learning to walk and I go like, oh, you're doing it. Oh, try it. You know, you have this like levity and excitement and joy for the process that in theory we have as adults, but it's so hard to actually embody. Have there been other places that you've found that parenting has either healed or reminded you of some of those places in you? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really been so constant, like such a, a, a constant series of reminders. When I think about how when I was in my 20s, I so easily accessed like the wild artist within me that was just like willing to try anything. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, adult Laura came in and like made a lot of pragmatic choices. But I look at you know, my son can access that at any time. And I'm able to see how valuable that is for him. And it reminds me that I really want to model that to him. And that there is another way, like we can still channel all those past selves. <laughs> like I think about it often, it's like, past Laura's aren't dead. They're like composted. They're still there. I just have to slow down to like, remember them and talk to them. Also, just like the willingness to constantly be a beginner. Mm. You know, I started grad school in May and there was like such an inner critic that was like, this is a horrible idea. It's going to sabotage your business. What if you're not great at it? <laughs> like you hate following other people's rules, all of these things. And I'm so glad that I did it anyway, because the minute I got started, it was like, oh my God, this is just so right for so mm. many reasons. And it's also been like a way to share that with my son. Like I do things sometimes for school that I don't actually really like. And he does things for school that he doesn't really like. When he goes to school and he's dragging his feet and he doesn't want to go, I'm like, I know I have that terrible professor today. <laughs> and like, mm. I really don't want to see her, but I really want that degree. And so... <laughs> Sometimes we, that's how it works. And it gets to remind us, we remind one another that we can do hard things. And that is for me, like just the greatest lesson of life that we can keep like increasing our discomfort threshold. And I want it for him and I want it for myself. That's so powerful. In navigating a divorce and co-parenting, are there tools you've found to create a situation that work for you guys. I think that mm -hmm. that is such a challenging topic for so many people. And I think that finding something that works for your family can be such an empowering thing to be able to speak to. I really appreciate you asking about that because I don't feel like, at least for me, that I was given a lot of examples of, of what that can look like. And I don't feel like it's talked about enough. I mean, I think... What has been really helpful for me is to get quiet in myself and take my time making decisions mm. and to be able to separate the Laura who is really sad that she lost her partner from the Laura who like wants a really abundant future for her kid. And I actually have found like the process to be very empowering when I am grounded, <laughs> which I always make a point of when I am making decisions mm -hmm. to, you know, be able to really listen to like, what is really important to me and what am I willing to let go of? Because there is a lot that you have to let go of mm. and to figure out, you know, is that a clear boundary? Is that confusing? And I mean, both boundaries for my child and boundaries for myself. What parenting time looked like was really, really important to me. Mm. 
We probably go back and forth more than many co-parented families. It happens to be what works well for us. I have a very close relationship with my former in-laws. It's really important to me since they are the grandparents in town that my son sees a lot of them. Mm. We spend Christmas together and birthdays together and we have a lot of communication And I only think that's possible because I prioritized separately my own healing process. I let myself be angry in a healthy way. (laughs) I let myself say, no, that that is not what I want. Mm -hmm. I think it would really not work if I was still the, the woman that was maybe modeled to be by my mother or grandmother who just like prioritizes everyone's well-being before her own. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I'm really able to anchor into what I want and know that helped enormously. But also, it is a journey. I mean, as, as cheesy as that sounds, I am more than three years in and there are still certain things that I'm like, oh, my God, that finally feels better. And that's a long time. Like in my head, I had like, I will recover for this within 12 months. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So being able to compartmentalize, but also that only happens if you really can do your own healing work and acknowledge your feelings. How have you created space for yourself to heal? I mean, part of it has been reconnecting with my art again. I was for three years the managing director of a public dance practice, Don't You Feel It Too?, The fact that they were a a big client of mine meant that I was often being reminded to do the practice, which is a practice of choosing music you really love, listening to it in your headphones, and then feeling what you feel and dancing. And that, for me, has been so powerful. And it's really different from my choreographic practice, which was really active up until 2018, where I was constantly like making things to put them on stage for other people. This has been just like, this is for me. This is music that reconnects me with myself, that allows me to feel things that just aren't convenient to feel within the workday or as a parent. And you take it slow. Lots of therapy, Mm -hmm. (laughs) lots of patience. And I really love the self-compassion exercises of Dr. Kristen Neff. I think her work of of helping people just acknowledge and normalize the fact that we're having a human experience. Yeah. It's like being a human is really tough shit. It is. It's really hard. And we give that compassion to the other people in our lives really easily But then, you know, I would find myself really beating myself up about like, why can I not just move on with my life? Like, but you also have to consider like, in the case of divorce or death, it's like not just that you lost something. It's like your whole future. It's like your whole identity. My identity as a wife, my identity as like Laura, who's going to grow old with someone as a mother who was like going to mother in a certain way. And I found like amazing richness in being a solo parent. I have like an amazing community that like is we have dinners with people all the time and just mm-hmm. great connections. But I was only able to get there by being like, oh my gosh, this is painful. Grieving the dreams that you've dreamed for what your future is going to look like and dreamed with somebody else and because we get those like really visceral images in our brain and to be able to say like, okay, well, it's going to look like something different and I'm going to love that eventually, but I need to grieve this first, I think is really huge. Yeah. And I think that's a great lesson for parenting as well. You know, we're so quick to be, at at least in our culture, along the lines of like, you're fine. You fell. You're fine. You're okay. You got this. It's fine that you're like pissed off about your stuffed animal. And yeah. It's really taught me that the more I can let my son just like feel what he feels, the faster he moves through it. Like, be pissed off. You dislike my decision making right now. Great. You can do that. You are allowed to disagree. 
you're also teaching that no emotion is so scary or off limits or too much for you or too much for the people in your life that you can't move through it in a healthy way. And like, as long as you're, you know, continuing to have conversations about like, you know, I can't have you punch something, but we can talk about like the feelings that are coming up and where that lives in your body or whatever. It's an empowering way to navigate your emotions, I think. Many of us can you know, relate to maybe having been given certain messages around our emotions or still feeling like we tiptoe around certain difficult emotions, it's good to remember that it's okay. In thinking about our conversation today, you mentioned talking about gender roles in 2021 and how that lives in our society and our relationships. Do you mind talking about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. I think it's very easy to think in 2021, at least for me, that we are past certain gender norms. And I even can remember a number of years ago when my son was young and I was just getting back to directing, directing a show that was about a woman's experience of sexism, like a a really good friend of mine, actually. And kind of thinking like, is this really as as big of a deal as she's portraying it. I mean, I don't know. I have a pretty egalitarian relationship and, you know, we both cook and do the laundry. And then I became a parent. And even in the early days of parenting, I still was weirded out with this idea that there was like a difference. I can remember a friend of mine saying like, I am going to like celebrate the hell out of Mother's Day. And I was kind of like, do we need to? I mean, it's... (laughs) But I was really in denial. I was in denial about certain things that, or maybe it wasn't even denial as much as not being fully conscious of how deeply ingrained certain beliefs around caregiving are in my body about how quick I am to prioritize, for instance, like the well-being of my partner before the well-being of myself. So you know what that looked like? for me was taking the responsibility for things like sleep training and getting up at night with this belief of like, you know, my partner really needs to sleep more than I do. And at certain points that may or may not have been true, it looked like fitting my work into like the tiniest little holes possible. Like I'll take Saturdays, I'll write a grant at like one in the morning, but then also be like interrupted while I'm grant writing by like a baby. Right. It meant like, you know, taking for granted that I would do, or, or I guess automatically doing the research around like baby led weaning and doctors and whatever challenges we were experiencing at the time as parents. And I think it did make me feel resentment without even realizing that that was happening. Mm. And so it's been super interesting to watch both clients move into parenthood, but also friends and to see their different approaches to gender roles, to parenting roles, And then, of course, you know, the differences and what the architecture of your work might look like as parents and wanting to have meaningful time with your kid and pick the right moment to move towards daycare or preschool. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the piece that I keep noticing is I see a lot of women who being a parent and being the one who's in control of so like that's holding so much of this is also a really big part of our identity. Yes. So there comes a point where you can start to let go. And I get really curious about like, you really don't want to let go. And you can't push someone to let go before they're ready to. But one beautiful thing that has come more recently out of co-parenting is, you know, and I still have a little bit more parenting time than my co-parent, but it is the most egalitarian that it has ever been. Like, It is the most egalitarian in that there's more of like, have I checked in on like, if we have this dental appointment, like we're both going to go to this other appointment. And part of it might be that, you know, my co-parents 
girlfriend reminds him of these things like she's a parent herself maybe he's able to be like oh my gosh it's really annoying when men aren't carrying their weight of things yeah so that might be a piece of it but it also has finally given me some space instead of just feeling grief in the moments where I don't have my kid it's also this like oh I get to take up space with these other parts of my life Mm. When we do that, we also are giving the women around us permission to do the same thing and to remember, like, you could have a really amazing relationship with your kid and not be with them constantly. Yes. It surprised me how challenging that place was for me, where it was like, even when you – Like I went into it thinking like, you know, I self-care is care for the baby and all of that kind of like mantras you can give to yourself. And then the actuality, it's like he's downstairs right now. I'm upstairs recording. And I feel that still that pull of like, should I be with him? I know he's sleeping right now. Is that, you know, it's like it's hard to turn it off because you're always on some level connected. And so to figure out like, but how do I can still live a full life as an individual while still embodying this full, very full title of mother? That balance is something that I've yet to strike, but is something I'm very curious about. And I loved what you said about by finding what works for you, how it ultimately gives permission to others. You know, just like the values, it's really important to remember that there is no one right way to do it. It's going to change a lot. What my life looked like when my son was one or one and a half is obviously dramatically different than it looks like now at six and a half. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it also has required me like continuing to check in with it. And, you know, during the pandemic, I remember my son said, I was like, do you know what my favorite thing is? And he was like, work. And... <laughs> And it was, you know, that moment where it's like, of course you feel that way because I have to work. You know, my my co-parent was dealing with his own challenges of like not having work for the pandemic time. So then you have this kid who thinks like, well, my mom is always juggling work, but I've also learned that he loves that. And he also knows that when I'm with him, especially now that he has school again, like I'm with him. Sometimes we'll sit down and we'll like do homework together. He's doing his, I'm doing mine. But the evolution has worked for both of us. And you just kind of keep honoring all those parts of yourself, like honoring the part of yourself that is like a new mom who's figuring it out, who does feel that connection, who, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to be compassionate with the parts of myself that wanted to just like be home with him for that time. Yeah, yeah. Like that, I don't regret any of that. Yeah. So both and. Both and, oh, both and, always both and. If you are finding that you need something different, what are ways that have worked for you to ask for what you need? Or what has your journey been like for asking for what you need? I I get asked this a lot and I wish... I had an easy answer, but if I'm going to be completely honest, a lot of it has come from like getting sick of my own suffering. Mm. (laughs) There are a lot of changes in my life that have not been able to happen until I've just gotten so sick of myself and remembered that there's a different way. So that's a piece. Another piece is just like finding role models. You know, I have a friend who's also a small business owner. We text each other every day to remind one another to not overwork. And her kiddo just turned five. We've been doing this for over two years now of texting each other. And she has noted, you know, why is it she's a published author? She has this business. Why is it that my partner never feels guilt? Like I go on book tour. I feel guilt. He does not, even though he's like a busy doctor. So it's just like, it starts with naming it, I think, and just being like, okay, I notice that I feel guilty and I don't really need to. It's not really serving me. It's not really serving our kid. That's something I want to begin to shift. So I think having some sort of accountability partner or outside support, I think having role models and being reminded that there are lots of 
ways to be a mother. Mm -hmm. I think just really staying compassionate with yourself and Mm -hmm. you notice, you adjust, you try again. And there's plenty of things I'm still adjusting, but I also look back and I'm like, oh, a lot has shifted and it's working so much better for me. When you're thinking about creating boundaries and making space for what you need, how? (laughs) How do you go about it? What is your journey like for saying like, okay, I asked for what I wanted. Now I'm going to stand inside of my boundary. I really love this idea of embracing the middle space. Like it is the both and. It's not either or. It's like, can I carve out a half an hour for myself? And so the same thing works with boundaries. Maybe we have to take baby steps towards our boundaries. Like maybe we are not ready to leap into these rigid boundaries and maybe we don't ever want rigid boundaries. In the case of some of the boundaries that I've set with even my clients or my work, it's thinking like, okay, it's really important. I thrive when I have my Sundays off. Like I can do my housework. I can see a friend. That's what's like giving me energy. Mm -hmm. And I would say that probably every six weeks, there's a Sunday that I know that if I don't spend that doing work, I'm actually going to be more stressed out than if I like really stuck to my boundary. Mm -hmm. And again, like, I really love this idea of neutral noticing. Like, can you take a step back from yourself and just look at yourself with curiosity and be like, I notice I keep relinquishing that boundary, but I know it's really important to myself. Can I try again? Could I tweak it a little bit to make it not feel so severe or so daunting? And then the other part of getting curious is like, can I get curious about what is the discomfort that I'm encountering around this? Like, I think often about how I would go into the studio and I remember I had received all this funding to do this project, but it also meant like I had to do the project Mm -hmm. And Fox was two, and it felt like just a lot of time away from him when we could have been spending our Saturdays together. It felt like that. It wasn't really a lot of time away from him in retrospect. But to get curious about the fact, it's like, who am I like outside of this? Like, that feels really uncomfortable. I'm so used to being the one who's like making all of the decisions and, you know, in being in charge of all of these things, maybe there's a part of me that really likes feeling needed in this way. Mm -hmm. A part of me. It's not all of me, but to just have compassion about that discomfort. I wanted to touch back to one other thing you said earlier in this conversation about guilt and how that arises and what you can do when that comes up. Thinking about you and some of the work that you do, what I'm really curious about is how guilt like really physically lives in the body and ways that you can kind of work to release that or engage with it in another way. Because I think sometimes we get very cerebral about it, but there are other ways to kind of loosen that up. I don't know if that resonates with you, but I wanted to offer that up. Yeah, I love thinking about that. I'm super curious about guilt, (laughs) like in general, like what it is, why it exists. You know, is it really guilt? Is it shame? Is it, does it go deeper than that? Do we feel the guilt because we look around and we see it so amplified among the women in our circle? Mm-hmm. One thing I'm really glad that I didn't have too many other mothers around me. Like I wasn't in like a lot of, say, like Facebook groups in early motherhood. And I have a lot of friends who are childless by choice. So I think getting clear about where it lives in your body or like the sensations of it, because the sensation is like such a part of that, is to really start to notice what it ties to. Like what's the fear behind the guilt? Yeah, getting curious about it again. Yeah, like is the fear that, you know, your child is no longer going to feel connected to you? Is the fear having to do with some of your own baggage around your childhood? What is that about? And and it's something that's really interesting to me. I see a lot of parents getting triggered when, for instance, their kids have special needs. Mm -hmm. You know, like my kiddo has very specific special needs. And it's easy to see like anytime like 
a, a teacher emails you as like, oh my gosh, this is a short, like my kid did that. <laughs> like he wet his pants. Um, and to just, the more we can kind of depersonalize some of this. Yeah. Be the observer, the curious observer again. Yes. And also I think a lot about like this kid in my, in my feeling about parenthood, it's like, he's not mine per se. He is like mine to guide. Mm. Like I'm here to like shepherd him and help him learn. Like that's the genesis of the word parents. It's like, we're here to teach. And if he decides that he wants to be like an auto mechanic and he wants to like pierce his whole body, I can't, these are like just arbitrary examples, but it's like, it's not about me. And I think taking the attitude of it really doesn't have to do with me really automatically removes some of the guilt. Yeah. Especially if we can also have the mindset of like, I truly am doing the best that I can. I'm living out the values I would want to in my parenting when part of that is like imperfection and repair. (laughs) It's like a lot of repair. Is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to mention before we wrap up? Two little things that I will mention that have been really helpful for me. One is just like staying connected to my future self. Because when we're mothers, we're like, we're so in the survival, the here and now And, you know, I think a lot about how so often women are encouraged to sometimes quit their jobs because, you know, you do the math and you're like, oh my gosh, by the time I pay for childcare, like I'm only making like this much money. And so I'll just not do it. And that's a valid, very valid choice. But sometimes when you think of that future you, it's like, what kind of seeds can you plant right now to care for her? Mm. even though you might not get, you might not be able to like really cultivate them and tend to them for quite a while. Like when I was a new mom, I had this like abundance of creative energy, which was like very surprising. And I think it's because I had had such an anxious pregnancy and I was like so sedated by all that progesterone. Mm. <laughs> I was just like not operating well. And he popped out and it was like, oh my God, I just like want to take over the world. Obviously (laughs) I could not. So I like just left voice memos for my future self. I was like, these are all these ideas. I hope we get to them. (laughs) And And the other thing is just remembering that we can seed support, just like we can like seed the future self. We can like very slowly cultivate it. And it doesn't have to be dramatic. It can be like, I am going to start this regular connection with these two friends who I feel like I can really share my mother self with, Mm. or I'm going to start therapy, or I am going to hire a babysitter who is just going to cover this one thing so that I can like go to yoga and then journal little tiny little bits of support. Where can people find you? Yeah, I am at laurahallway.com, H-O-L-W-A-Y, and then on Instagram at laura.hallway. Thank you. Wonderful. And I would definitely really guide people to your website because in just doing a deep dive and and reading about everything you're doing, your work sounds beautiful. And I was like, okay, I want to do this. So I I just think you're doing really powerful, wonderful stuff. Mm, Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, it has really been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast and visit our blog at weekbyweekpodcast.com. Check out the show notes for more information about our guests and additional resources I used and referenced during this episode. This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa and Dave Hill and edited by Douglas Sarine and Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.